this lecture, it's going to be about viruses. I just realized that I said to you guys to read chapter eight, but there's also some parts of chapter nine that I'm going to add to this. It's only about two sections, so you're going to be able to see them. So what we're going to be doing is looking at the discovery of viruses, the replication, and going to take the time to then explore a couple of examples for you. And I will begin by showing you uh, and introducing you to you the hoof and mouth disease. This hoof and mouth disease, it is a contagious disease that happens in cattle and happens in swine and also it could happen in other kinds of creatures. And it is devastating economically because, as you know, we're living in the Central Valley, we have a lot of cattle, and it affects sheep, deer, and all kinds of cloven hooves, which are the animals that have two hooves, um, ruminants. Now, as you can see, they, this is an open sore here that has burst in the mouth of the cow, and here you have uh, a big sore in the hoof of the cow. So you can see that the animal gets affected by it. These sores are very painful to the animal, and it can be spread really rapidly. And if you start to look online to pictures like this, what you find is that a lot of animals get sacrificed immediately and destroyed, because there's really a lot of problems. So it's very difficult to control, and it's one of the most dreaded diseases that people that have stock as cattle have to face. Now, this disease has been known from us for a couple of centuries ago. Bye-bye. Okay, she decided to leave. All right. Okay, continue with the class. Um, in 1898, what we have is Friedrich Lofer and Paul Foss, they were in Germany. And what they were doing was trying to figure out how this tackle. Remember, this is the time already of Pasteur and Koch. And they took the liquid-filled blisters from the mouth of the cow and, or the source of, of the source, of the source of the hoof, and they infected other cows with it. And they believe, you know what, the liquid is infectious, and therefore there must be an infectious agent present. But they attempted the Koch postulates. So they took the blisters, they put it in another cow, they were able to get the cows to get sick, but... They couldn't culture what was going on. And when they look, there was nothing in the liquid of the blisters. So it was mostly sterile. There were no bacteria. And if there were bacteria that they found, those bacteria did not cause disease. So they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we apply cause postulates? We take it from a disease cow, we put it on a new one, we get disease, but uh, we cannot culture this. So they're having this issue. So they had the conclusion, number one, this disease may not be due by a bacterium or a bacterium that we cannot culture and therefore we have no idea what it is. And when they look at the microscope in those days, remember this is 1898, they couldn't see anything. So they figure out, okay, maybe there is a toxin involved and maybe we, we know that some bacteria produce toxins and that those toxins are going to be uh, causing disease or something that is a lot more smaller than bacteria. So they went ahead, they filtered the bacteria out, and they inoculated the cows with the liquid from those blisters, and again, they got disease in the cows. So that didn't seem to be doing this. So I mean, is it a soluble toxin then? If the bacteria are not producing this, is this a soluble toxin coming up? So they decided, you know what, if we passage this thing, the, the, the toxin will be diluted away and therefore, we shouldn't get any problems. So they went ahead, they did some pathogen to exclude the toxin, and when they added the liquid back to the cows, they got disease one more time. So they feel great. Something is replicating in the host, in the cows, in this hoof. They're having this nasty source in their mouth, and we don't know what it is. So they thought because they could filter it and they still cause disease that the agent must be very tiny and smaller than any bacteria because with bacteria they would have been able to cut it in the filter and therefore prevent disease. So this gave us the working definition of what a virus now we have is. That it is a filterable agent and that it can be passage from culture to culture. Now, 
Now, 1935, let's jump ahead in time, and that is when Wesley Stanley crystallized the tobacco mosaic virus. Again, this case, the tobacco mosaic virus, it's a virus that causes wilting in the tobacco plants, and as you know, tobacco was a very important agricultural product. And what they decided to find, you know, we can actually crystallize it and see it in the electron, trans, uh, electron microscope. And therefore, there is something there. And the advent of that allows us to now look at the viruses in more uh, detail. And this picture over here is a picture of a phage that you can see. So these structures show that this filterable, passageable entities were structures that were found in the liquid and they could not be cultured at the time. So when they started to look at the, at the viruses, they find, you know what, they have different shapes. Some of them are uh, helical, like the tobacco mosaic virus, or some of them are going to be icosahedral, which is actually a 20-sided uh, polygon. Some of them are simple, just virus and uh, nucleic acid, and the other ones are more complex, and those tend to be the envelope viruses that either have a membrane around them, or like in this case, this phage, they have other structures besides the icosahedral. So um, the more complex ones, as you can see here, are the phages. So I'm going to take a look into that. And what we have found is that viruses infect all the domains. You have viruses in bacteria, viruses in archaea, and of course, viruses in eukarya. So when we look at them, structure-wise, the tobacco mosaic virus is an example of a helical virus. As you can see, there's a single molecule, in this case of RNA, and that molecule, it's being surrounded by monomers of a coat protein. And those monomers, uh, called capsomeres in this case, that look like little uh, Dutch shoes, they bind to the nucleic acid and then they polymerize to one another, forming what you see here as this fiber. So that will be the helical kind of virus. Now, you have other, the icosahedral ones that I mentioned to you, and the most common icosahedral, and more the most basic, I don't say more common, are the naked viruses, which is basically a capsule, and that capsule contains some type of nucleic acid inside of it. Some viruses have evolved the capacity to isolate and obtain a membrane from the host cell, and those are going to be the enveloped ones. Like in this case, you can appreciate here in the middle, you have the capsid containing the nucleic acid, but surrounding that, there is a membrane, a membrane bilayer, and that membrane bilayer also have proteins. Most of these proteins tend to be host, uh, excuse me, most of these proteins tend to be viral encoded, but sometimes they will also take membrane proteins from the host. When we look at the basic icosahedral structure, as I mentioned to you, those of you who have ever played D&D, you have a 20-sided die, that is the icosahedral. And the icosahedral has 20 faces, so we can actually look at different subunits of it. You have an angle over here that has five axes, you have an angle here that has two, and an angle that you can put it has uh, three facets. So for example, any monom every multimer of that could be made. So for example, here in this particular virus, here you go your pentamer situation right there, and you can then have that virus with a simple capsule um, expand and make it more complicated. So I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, discussing the actual structure, just to give you an idea of it. This is more as of a view. Those of you taking virology will get a more in-depth uh, look at this. And here, last, and this is why I'm taking this time, is to bring you up to the phages, because we're going to be looking at some molecular biology that is very fascinated based on phage biology. And this phage, which I believe is a T4, uh, has an icosahedral head, has a tail and a collar, and then the end plate with little tail spins, and you have these fibers which are sticking around, um, helping the virus. So it looks very really space-like, like a, um, like a, um, like a kind of capsule that we'll be able to use in a spaceship. Now, when we think about it in general, the viruses are very, very small, between 20 to 400 nanometers in size. They are acellular. They are not considered a living organism per se. There is no cell. They do not have metabolism. So they have the most basic viruses are going to be protein and nucleic acid. They do not have um, other machinery. Some of them may have that lipid bilayer, but the lipid bilayer comes from the host. All of them are infections. 
and they are obligate intracellular parasites. For them to perform their function and to be able to propagate, they need to have a host. And the host is going to, uh, the mechanism of the host are going to be hijacked to allow the replication of the virus. So whatever the nucleic acid of the virus is, is going to use the mechanisms from the host. The host is going to provide all the materials and the virus most likely is going to provide the genome as well as some of the proteins for doing this. Now they have quote unquote living characteristics because they can replicate and mature but they are not living because, again, they have no metabolism on their own. They need to have some level of host. And some viruses actually require other viruses. They are parasitic on other viruses, depending to what they need to do. So part of the idea is that as technology evolved, in particular with phages, we needed to learn how to quantitate them. This is part of the reason why the Cox phosphorus didn't work originally, because we didn't have the technology to be able to grow them. But nowadays, we do and therefore we can uh, able to isolate them. And for that kind of isolation, what we usually do is to, especially in the case of a phage, we can put a lawn of bacteria on our Petri dish and then add diluted amount of viruses to them as you will do with uh, cell culture. You do multiple dilutions of that, you then plate them. And everywhere that a phage falls, it will infect the cell. That cell will then produce more phage infecting the surrounding cells, and what you then generate is an area of clearings around the point where the phage landed. And that we call a plaque. So everything around this plaque is a lawn of cells, and everything in the plaque are dead cells, and therefore that's why you don't have any turbidity in that area. But that area is full of phages. So in this case, for us to quantitate it, just in the same way that we have done with any plate count mechanism, you just go ahead and count the number of plaques, and we call those plaque forming units to determine the concentration of phages in a culture that you will have. Now, for eukaryotic viruses, it's a tiny bit more complicated because uh, we need to find a cell that is infectable by them. We generate a monolayer uh, in a tissue culture plate in the lab, and then that monolayer we infect. And that area of clearings that you can see here is the plaque. So we can also use this now to quantitate uh, viruses. So if you're looking, for example, at a eukaryotic virus that is affecting humans, for example, we can use uh, monkey kidney cells, grow them on a monolayer, do a dilution, infect that monkey kidney layer, and then find the number of plaques that are formed. Therefore, we can know how many they are. So the technology now allows us to be able to do cost postulates with viruses because we can grow them either in, in a culture of uh, phages, if it's a phage, or a culture of eukaryotic cells depending on the type of tropism. Tropism means the kind of cell that the virus likes to infect. And uh, we can then grow them up to determine the cell numbers and then isolate them from that and add them up. So that was part of the reason why at the beginning the Koch postulates were not working. They couldn't grow them up because they didn't know and they couldn't see them. And now, as you know, with the electron microscope, we can see them. So to take a quick look at the basic replication of a bacteriophage, what we're going to have is the following. First of all, we're going to have a um, col culture of cells. Here is our host, this is our bacteria, and we're going to infect it with our phage. Most phages, as you remember from bio 2, are going to bind to the outside of the host cell, and the protein code doesn't come inside. Remember the experiments of Hershey, looking to try to determine what was the genetic material, either inside the nucleic acid or outside the protein. So here you have what we call is the attachment. And the attachment is mediated by receptors on the phage that are going to bind to receptors on the bacteria. Now, the phage is going to inject its nucleic acid inside the, uh, the host cell. And we call it the viral penetration of the nucleic acid. And that nucleic acid, depending on the phage, is going to do multiple different things. It's going to replicate. It could in it could uh, bind to the chromosome and become part of the chromosome, or it can immediately take hold of the bacterial genetic material and start making more of itself and making proteins, which is what you see over here in this uh, stage number three. 
So that will be the synthesis of the viral nucleic acid and production. Those proteins that are encoded by the phage self-assemble into a capsid when they trap the nucleic acid, and therefore you're going to have the assembling and packaging of that nucleic. You assemble the core first, and then you package the nucleic acid after that. It could happen actually simultaneously. Both of them do it together. And after that, the phage may encode for lytic proteins that are going to allow it to burst the cell open, releasing the phages all around it. So when we look at the actual um, time period of this, we have it in a graph like the one shown over here. And what we're looking in the y-axis is the relative virus count as plague forming units. Remember doing the plague assay when we have the little plaques being formed on the lawn, you can then take the sample of your culture and do a time course and see when the plaque comes. So when we have it here at the beginning, we added the virus to our bacterial culture right there. And at that point, what we have is the early uh, enzymes being transcribed and translated into from the phage using the cell material, the cell machinery, excuse me, that are, are going to allow this to be made. So those proteins are going to be done, and they are going to allow now the phage uh, nucleic acid to be replicated. That is happening at the second stage over here. Notice that at that point, we call this, um, those nucleic acids are going to make more proteins, and here are the proteins of the coat, that particle that is going to be assembled. And if you look at this, there are no plaques being made at that point because the phage is taking control of the bacterial machinery to make more of its proteins for making things, more of its nucleic acid, and at the end, more proteins of the coat. Once that you begin to have that last part of the assembly and the uh, packaging of the nucleic acid, you begin to have an increase in the amount of plague-forming units, and at the end, the virus burst the cell, and that's where you have the maximum number of plaque-forming units. So this is not the same kind of curve that we see with bacteria. It's like a one-shot uh, production of phage, with very little phage produced during the early stages of phage biology, when it's making the proteins, when it's making nucleic acids, and at the end when it's making the coat protein, and later phage being made and detectable once the assembly and packaging is actually done. So now, when we look at phages, phages can infect and use receptors on the bacteria that are very varied. Some of them are going to be able to bind to the flagellum of bacteria like the chi phage. Other ones like the M13 and the MS2 phage, we're going to look more at MS2 today, are able to bind to the pillars of bacteria and use that to get their nucleic acid inside. Remember, the pillars, as we have discussed, is hollow, as well as the flagellum. Other ones are going to use specific receptors. For example, T1 uses the iron transport protein complex to be able to get its nucleic acid inside. And T4 is going to recognize other molecules on the outer membrane. The last ones over here are thigh X174 that could recognize LPS. Later, what we're going to see is that this different kind of receptor is going to mediate the tropism. What kind of bacteria can be infected? So keep that in mind if we're saying, for example, using MS2 as an infectious virus. Which kind of bacteria can be infected by MS2? Now, when we look at the genome in general of viruses, we can subdivide the viruses by uh, seven different classes according to the Baltimore classification. And it's basically determined according to the genome. Some viruses are going to have DNA as their genome. Other ones are going to have RNA as their genome. And when you have DNA, they could either be a double-stranded DNA as you know it, or it could be a single-stranded DNA. The RNA viruses can have either your normal single-stranded RNA, but they can also have the double-stranded RNA as a genome. And as you know, like in the case of retroviruses, they are viruses that can have an RNA genome that gets tran reverse transcribed to a DNA genome that gets incorporated into the chromosome, and from there later you can make your RNA to make proteins and package a thing. So 
the rotaviruses are single-stranded RNA genomes, and then the hepatinoviridae, which cause hepatitis, are viruses that have a double-stranded DNA that go through an RNA intermediate to make more DNA. So, depending on the type, David Baltimore, the Nobel Prize winner, classified the viruses according to that. And again, I'm putting this here for you to get an idea of it, not for you to memorize what are these seven classifications of David Baltimore. But most of the viruses in phages in bacteria, they tend to be double-stranded um, DNA viruses, and very few of them are RNA viruses. So as you can see, um, in viruses over here for phages, you have some double-stranded and some uh, single-stranded RNA. The animal viruses span the entire gamut. So when you take virology with us here at UC Merced, you will then learn a lot more about this particular issue. So what we have learned is that because of this difference in genome, viruses have fantastic ways of metabolizing their number one RNA and number two, their genome. So when you look at class one and class seven viruses, those are double-stranded DNA viruses. So how do they make RNA? In the same way that you have learned. They use the template strand to make a positive RNA molecule. The, the positive RNA molecule is the one that we consider to be um, to code protein. Why is that important? Well, because there are some viruses that have a negative single strand RNA. That negative RNA does not encode for protein. That, for example, will be the class 5. And for that molecule, for that virus to make RNA to make a protein, it still has to use that negative strand and have what is called an RNA-independent RNA polymerase to make positive RNA. You see what I'm talking about? So you have to be very careful about that. So for example, you have class 2. Those are the single-stranded positive RNA. So that is going to be a virus that has the genic strand. So what happens for that virus to make RNA, it has to make the opposite strand first, the template strand. Remember, RNA is, trans uh, it is generated by transcription from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So it's going to use the transcript strand, which is the 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So you have to make that other strand first. And now, through having a double-stranded DNA intermediate, you can now use the, the uh, template strand to make your RNA. So the biology of a double-stranded type 1 or type 7 virus is different from the type 2 because of the molecular genome that it has. Now, type 3s have the double-stranded uh, RNA. And what they can do, basically, is use the minus strand and use it to make transcription using an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, just like it would be DNA. So just look for the template strand. The positive strand uh, RNA, which are the class 4, those are themselves are an mRNA molecule. So proteins can be directly translated from them. So that could be just used directly. And the last but not least, the retroviruses, um, which have a positive strand um, RNA, they will go through reverse transcription first, become a double-stranded DNA provirus, that will be incorporated into the host chromosome, and from there, using the template strand, you make RNA. The lower part of this figure, um, it's talking about how those genomes get replicated. So take a look and study this carefully, because I don't want to spend too much time looking at this. So for example, the class one virus has a double-stranded DNA. Well, when you're going to duplicate that genome, you're going to use a semi-conservative double-stranded DNA replication, just like you have learned. But the ones which are, for example, an, um, a minus RNA, let's look at this class 5 over here, the, the genome is a negative strand RNA. So what do, how do they replicate their genome? They make a positive strand RNA, and from the positive strand RNA, using an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, they make more negative RNA. So take a moment to carefully examine the lower portion of this figure so you know how each of these types of viruses are able to make their genome replication, as well as how, in the upper portion, how each kind of these viruses are able now to make RNA to make proteins, okay?
All right, so take a look at that. So as a virus example, I'm going to bring you influenza. Why? Because we're going to look about genetic drift and genetic sh shift later, and I want you to be familiar with how influenza works. An influenza virus, it's a eukaryotic virus. This eukaryotic virus has a genome that is double-stranded RNA, and it has eight chromosomes inside of it, and they're linear. Part of that, um, it is an envelope virus, shown over here, so you can see the envelope, and on its surface of that virus, you have two major proteins that we're going to discuss. One of them is going to be the hemagglutinin molecule, that it is a trimer, and the other one is going to be the neuromidinous protein, which is a tetramer. I hope I'm doing that, saying that right, because I always confuse those two. Did I do it right? Those of you taking virology? Right, I'll figure it out. If I, if, I make, if I mess that up, I'll correct myself later. But anyway, you always have been listening in the news about the H1N1 virus. So what I'm having here in this table, it's uh, the subtypes of H protein, the hemagglutinin, and the subtype of the neuromidinous protein. So right now we consider, and this is maybe outdated already, but we have 15 different types of H subtypes in the surface of some of these influenza viruses, of which only subtype 1, 2, and 3 are found in viruses that infect humans. Notice, however, that H1 and H3 also infect pigs. All of them are found to infect birds. Think about geese that are flying about in their normal migration route, or chickens in the farm, and of these pores are only infected with three, and with seven. Now, the neuronibin is subtypes. Human and swine are affected by N1 and N2. I think N3 has to be added to this list. There is an N3 uh, for human, I believe, now. Horse is affected by N7 and N8, and the bird takes all of them. What we're going to learn learning about this is that um, influenza comes in three flavors, type A, type B, and type C. A is the most common pathogenic strain that we know about the pandemics. Think about the Spanish flu, which is the H1N1 strain. Um, because of the RNA genome, they can have a lot of different mutations. And this issue that we're going to discuss later during our point in infectious diseases, it's the antigenic shift, which is the capacity of a virus to switch these molecules on its surface and therefore generate new subtypes. Now, here is the picture again of the virus now from an electron microscope. You can see it. Historically speaking, if you look at this graph in here, and that graph is looking at mortality in the US from the 1900s to the uh, end of the century, you see that the mortality was going down, um, that the expectancy was going down, down, down. So more people were living and having happy life except this big spike over here. And that spike over there was happening during World War I. But that's not really the case of that spike. That is the case of the Spanish flu in 1918, which killed 20 million people in the first year with this H1N1 virus. It's actually, it's called, it started in Puerto Rico. That's where it uh, was found the first time. And according to this, it killed 80% of the people died in the war, died from the influenza. So later, in the 57, there was another pandemic we call the Asian flu. That's an H2N2 kind of virus with about 70,000 deaths. And in 1968, the Hong Kong flu came up, which an H3N2. And that was about 34,000 deaths in the US. Later, we're going to talk about vaccination. And the fact that this waves are happening on a yearly basis. They get carried around by the migration of birds, which as you can see from this figure, the birds carry the reservoir of the majority of this influenza virus. And when we talk about the fact that the birds coming in contact with swine, we are in contact with swine. So the swine, the pig, can be infected by both bird as well as human viruses. And in the swine, a tertiary host, now you can have like a cocktail mixer, which is going to mix them together since you have eight different chromosomes and generate a brand new strain that can initiate another pandemic. And that's why the vaccination for 
uh, influenza happens on a yearly basis, that depending on what is the strain that is predominantly being carried by the birds around and infecting other areas. So most likely epidemiologists around the world are usually looking to see what they are and they make a prediction. And like it happens about five years ago, that prediction failed and the strain of virus that became really virulent wasn't the one they've made the vaccine against. So that is also the reason why we're always asking people to get vaccinated on a yearly basis. Anyway, I'm using this as an example to bring you this information so you get a better idea about influenza. Uh, I remove a lot of the viruses from the lecture because I condense it into one. And what I'm going to do now is to look a little bit more closer about some of the replication of and gene regulation within the viruses because it's fascinating. And what I'm going to start to do is to look at Fh lambda as an example. So Fh lambda is a DNA double-stranded virus that has a linear genome. It infects E. coli, so it's an enterovirus. Its genome, its structure is shown over here. It has an icosahedral capsid and a tail. It doesn't sometimes have little spikes at the very end. So it looks more like a, like a lollipop than anything. The capsid, it's about 50 nanometers in diameter, and the tail is about 150 nanometers in length, so it's kind of large. And its genome is linear. Now, this is an image of the genome, and as you can see, it has a lot of different genes involved in it. You have, uh, as a linear genome, you have an area at the very end with 12 bases, which are called the cohesive ends, and those 12 bases are allowing the phage virus to bind to one another and circularize. So the cohesive events are identical and complementary to one another, and therefore it allows this linear DNA molecule that is inside the capsule to circularize inside the cytoplasm of the microorganism. What we're going to look in a moment is the fact that you have this area of regulation over here with multiple promoters. And this is going to become a little bit crazy, so I'm going to do my best to try to explain it. And if you come to office hours, you can actually spend a lot of time looking at this. Because what we're going to look is that this virus is able to transcribe genes from that regulation area to the left and to the right. And transcription, depending on what gets transcribed, this virus has a very interesting life cycle in which it can be lytic, therefore infecting the bacterial cells and killing them immediately, or it can be lysogenic which basically means that the virus infects the cells, it goes and in, inserts its chromosome in the DNA of the bacteria, and it goes on stealth mode, allowing the bacteria to divide, and every time the bacterium divides, you make a new copy of the genome with the genome of the bacteria. And that eventually allows the, the virus to make many bacteria that are infected. So now, Let's look at the replication of this genome for a second. So you get an idea of what's going on, because it's actually, we learn a huge amount of molecular biology by studying phages. So here what we have is the lambda phage infecting your bacterial cell. The coat stays outside. The double-stranded linear genome goes inside the uh, cytoplasm. And here in the end, as you can see, are the cohesive ends. The cohesive ends are going to allow that phage chromosome to circularize. Now, um, once circularized, you can have division like we have learned for the bacterial chromosome via the theta structure. And the theta structure, as you remember, is going to have two replication forks that eventually are going to give you two circular chromosomes that can be replicated. So that is able to uh, allow the um, genome of the virus to replicate. And that kind of theta replication happens early during the infection stage. Now, later during the infection phase, when the virus is trying, when this phage, excuse me, it's trying to make more phage, the genome is linear. So it's not going to work as easily to make circular copies of the DNA. And what it's going to do is do a replication type called rolling circle. And the rolling circle replication is shown here in the middle. So imagine that you have a roll of tape, so your chromosome is circular, and now you separate the tape and you start to pull it. That is going to serve as the place where you can have now replication occurring, and out of replication from um, rolling tape, you can have copies of the linear genome of the virus 
that can eventually get packaged inside the virion, and those virions then can lyse the cell and bring it out. So let's just take a look at that more carefully. So as the chromosome gets a single nick at the replication type, you can start to separate one strand. Here the strand that we're going to separate is the dark green strand. The other strand in the middle, let's call that the template strand, is going to stay completely unreplicated. When you break that DNA, one end is going to have a 3' hydroxyl group. So you already have, quote unquote, your primer to allow synthesis to happen immediately and I put a little arrow curve over there in that green, and I'm going to call that the leading strand. Now on the other side, which is this one over there, this is the three prime end, and there, uh, excuse me, the five prime end, and therefore you need to start adding primers with primase. So you're only adding primase, primase is only adding primers to one strand that later is able to replicate that, and here you get the formation of your Okazaki fragments, that are going to be uh, eliminated the RNA by DNA polymerase 1 and later fixed by ligase. So this strand it's going to be replicated and eventually you have the elucidation of one of those strands that give you now the genome in a linearized form. So you only have one origin of replication. When you have the theta replication you have two Replication forks, one going to the left and one going to the right on the replication fork. When you do this kind of uh, rolling circle replication, you only have one replication fork. So take, make, up, make sure that you understand the difference between theta replication and Rolly strand replication. This could be an awesome question for an exam. So anyway, the virus is going to make a choice. Do I, when I infect the cell, do I go to the lysogenic state or do I go to the lytic state? So just to give you a quick review, here you have your virus, the thing that this is lambda. Lambda injects its genome. Here the chromosome, they made it just uh, green, just for, uh, and linear. The light green is the chromosome of the microorganism. The dark green is the chromosome of the phage. And what's going to happen is that depending on the decision, the virus will go into a lytic pathway or it's going to go into a lysogenic pathway. So let's say that lysogenic pathway what is going to happen is that now the DNA of that uh, virus is going to be incorporated into the genome of the host as a pro-virus. And now that prophage or pro-virus will replicate and every time the, daughter, the, uh, the mother cell replicates, each daughter cell is going to have a copy of that viral genome inserted in its chromosome. So this is a quote-unquote latent infection because the phage is not making active proteins of its own. The phage is not making uh, particles of its own. It can be making proteins, but it cannot make particles to assemble them and kill the cell. However, from that perspective, you can also have the opposite. The opposite will be the infection of the phage and going into the lytic cycle. And that is the description of what I showed you earlier in lecture, where that lytic event is going to initiate the replication of the genome of the phage. You're going to make the proteins that are going to eventually make the virions. Then you have assembly and the cell will burst, releasing all the little phages outside of it. The thing goes, is like, how is the phage decision being made? And that's what I want to talk to you about now. One thing that I want to bring up to you is that eventually a lysogenic phage can go through a mechanism of induction, and that can be different from every lysogenic phage, and that can act a lytic pathway. So that will be the point in which now going from your stealth mode, that phage is going into an active replicative infection that is going to eventually lead to the production of particles that are going to be killing the bacteria and being released outside. So these two stages are not exclusionary. So during lysogeny, why would a phage want to do lysogeny? You know what? If there are not enough nutrients, the phage will not have sufficient, the bacteria will not have sufficient molecules to make phage particles. You have to replicate DNA. So therefore you need nucleotides. You need to have a lot of amino acids to make the particles of the phage. If you are in a nutrient starved environment, it is not advantageous for the phage to kill the bacteria because it cannot 
um, make more phage particles. So keeping itself dormant in the host until better growth conditions happen, it will be advantageous for the phage to, um, to extend its life. So that prophage is going to survive until the conditions are appropriate for it to be replicated. So the other part about this is that the host are going to be important. You may have a certain particular virus in a host and you can have other phages that may be attacking that host at the same time. So the lysogeny is going to allow that virus to prevent other bacteria over, I mean, to prevent the bacteria from being infected by other phages. There are ways in which the phage can do that. So if you have high multiplicity of infection, meaning that you have very high number of phages in an environment, an infected bacteria can prevent other phages from infecting that bacteria already. They have ways of minimizing, for example, the surface receptors that could lead to binding of that phage to the bacteria. So they can protect the host. So let's take a look at Lambda to see how Lambda is doing this. What I want to call your attention, it's this yellow area over here that it's the central control unit of the Lambda phage. And that area has two promoters and operators. You have a promoter right region and an operator right region that's going to initiate transcription to the right of that side and you have a promoter left and an operator left region that is going to initiate transcription to the left side of that central point. In between here, what we have are the genes. There's a gene for a protein called C1. There is, uh, to the left, there's a protein called N and a protein called C3. To the right, we have a protein called CRO. C2, OPQRS are the next proteins. I also want to call your attention to those three blue regions. Those three blue regions are termination, transcription termination regions. What's going to happen is that if you're going to have transcription to the left, when you get to that blue region, transcription will stop. Why is that important? I'm going to show you. So what I'm going to show you here too is that you have three, you have four, excuse me, transcription levels. You have transcription to be considered left one, that is going to be the left one transcription, and you have another smaller left two transcription going to the left, and you have transcription right one and transcription right two. Transcription right one is going to be transcribing the genes of Crow, C2, O, P, and Q, and transcription right two is going to be transcribing this genes A, W, B, etc. And those, we call them late genes because they are the genes that involve the virion itself. So the head and the tail genes, etc., etc., And the gels, and the gel, and the genes, excuse me, that are going to encode for lysis. So now, DNA replication are going to be the genes found in this location. The repressor is C1. So let's take a look at how this is happening. Oh, before I go. Here we have an excision gene, an integration gene, and the ATT uh, region. And that ATT region is going to allow the viral genome to integrate itself into the chromosome. Now, this is a figure from a different book that I think explains this a lot better. And I'm going to upload the text that goes along with this. What I want you to see here, it's your double-stranded DNA molecule. On the top, you have proteins. On the bottom, you have regulatory units. So what we have here is PL for promoter left, OL for operator left. You have the TL for termination left. That is one of those termination sequence. Here you have another promoter, promoter P1. To the right, you have promoter R, operator uh, R. You have another promoter, promoter RM. So there's a lot of promoters in this region. You have promoter RE, termination sequence R1, and termination sequence R2. So you have all those things present. The genes are on the top. C1, N, C3, C2, OPQ, 
XIS and INT. So let me walk you through this. And what I want you to think about is the fact that when the bacteria is infected and it now um, gets the DNA of the phage to be um, injected in the cytoplasm, you're going to have transcription actively from promoter left and promoter right simultaneously. And that is going to give you two protein, two tRNAs, two uh, mRNA, excuse me. So transcription is going to begin simultaneously from promoter R and promoter left. And that is going to give you this little red mRNAs. One of them is going to encode for a protein N, but you're going to now encounter that termination sequence. Therefore, that transcription stops right there, only making an mRNA that is going to encode for protein N. From the right-hand side, you're going to have transcription from promoter R, and it's going to go and make CRO protein, and it terminates itself on termination R1. So the very first two proteins that are going to be eventually made are going to be N and are going to be CRO. Now, here is when N comes into play because N is an anti-termination protein, meaning that N is going to bind to that RNA when it's being made, and instead of allowing it to terminate at the termination sequences, it's going to extend the RNA molecule and allow transcription to occur more. So when N is made, which is this anti-terminator, you are going to now have, by the action of N protein, much longer mRNAs. So as you can see from the left-hand side, that mRNA is going to have N, C3, XIS, and from the right-hand side, you're going to have CRO, C1, OP, and some Q by the action of N. And here is when things get interesting because you're making these proteins. And depending on the condition where the cell is living, those proteins are going to be affecting the decision of either killing the cells to a, a lytic pathway or allowing the cell to live and inducing integration through the lysogenic mechanism. Now, let's look at lysogeny. As I remember, as I show you from here, now you have N protein and you have C3 and you have C2. Right? So far so good? So C3 and C2 form a complex. C2 is an extremely labile protein. It could be destroyed by proteases. C3 is the bodyguard that protects it from degradation. So presence of C3 will bind to C2, and those two proteins now are able to bind different promoters. So if C3 and C2 are made, because C2 is not being degraded by proteases, what you're going to have is now the binding of C2 to promoter I, that is going to make more XIS and the integrase, which is going to allow to generate a protein that is going to integrate the genome of the virus into the genome of the host, you are going to have the transcription to the left from promoter RE, and RE um, promoter stands for uh, promoter repression of establishment. And you also are going to have left transcription from promoter R prime. And that promoter R prime is going to make an RNA that is backwards. It is a complementary copy to the RNA of Q. Now, that um, RNA, if you have any RNA that was made at the beginning that, enclosed, that includes Q, that anti-Q RNA is going to be able to bind it and destroy it. So you are now eliminating the possibility of the cell of making protein Q. You also have now protein C1, and C1 is the lambda repressor. The lambda repressor, it's the molecule that masterminds lysogeny. Lambda repressor is able to bind to the promoter um, RM, 
which is maintenance, and make more R1, C1. So it can make more of itself. It also inhibits promoter right. Yes, Sandra. Um, when you said there was the, the cue was destroyed, does that basic gene silencing mechanism? Or is it it's a different? mechanism of gene silencing by binding the RNA being made from promoter R prime binds now to the RNA from the promoter right that was made originally. And that makes a double-stranded RNA, which is Exactly. Silent. That makes a double-stranded RNA that is silent. Well said. <laughs> C1 can buy to promoter left and inhibits and silences them because it binds to the operator left. Binding to operator left silences the genes and C3, etc., etc. et cetera. So you do not make any more n proteins. Binding to the promoter uh, RPM, it's basically binding to the operator R, so it therefore silences everything to the right of that, including CRO. So these genes to the right are not going to be transcribed. So it's going to inhibit promoter right. It activates promoter RM, which is going to make more C1. So it's constantly making more protein and that is going to maintain the lysogenic cycle. So the lysogenic cycle is maintained in the presence of C2 and C3, which are going to allow C1 to be made. On the other hand, you have now CRO. Remember that CRO was being made over here at the beginning. CRO is also another transcription factor. It needs to dimerize, but it has very poor affinity for its promoters. Therefore, only when sufficient crop protein is made, it can stably bind to its sites. In the case that you are favoring the lytic cycle, crow protein, sufficient crop protein is going to be made. That crop protein now is going to be able to bind to the operator left, silencing it too. But it's going to bind to promoter right, making more crow, C2, OP, and Q. N is already there because it's being made from the beginning. Now, the making of Q is going to allow Q to bind to this promoter right to make the other genes S, R, etc., etc., that are needed for the lytic cycle. This is why it is important for the lysogenic pathway to prevent the protein Q from being made because protein Q activates the lysogenic uh, the lytic cycle. CRO eventually binds over here, making more of itself, and therefore allowing to make other proteins. C2 will be made as well, but because you have inhibited C3, there is no bodyguard saving C2 from degradation, and therefore you prevent the lysogenic cycle from being made. So you have now an idea of the mechanisms of activation of the lytic versus lysogenic, but how does the cell make that decision? Because at the beginning, as you can see from here, you get C3, CRO, and C2. So how is this then regulated? And this is the image over here to show. Everything is based on nutrient availability. When you have sufficient nutrients, you're going to have a lot of proteases being made. Those proteases um, are going to target C2. So if you have a lot of nutrients, C3, even though it protects C2 from degradation, is not sufficient to target and protect C2. And therefore, you're going to break down C2. Breaking down C2 prevents the C2-C3 complex from being made, and therefore, you prevent the activation of C1. In the other hand, if the nutrients are limited, now, in limited nutrient availability, you have low amount of proteases. Low amount of proteases means that C2 is not going to be targeted for destruction, C3 will be able to protect it, and therefore you're able to now eventually activate C1, which will lead to lysogeny. So in that case, C3 activates and stabilizes C2, both of them can now bind to their uh, promoters and figure out the establishment of lysogeny. Remember, that one of the proteins was going to make during lysogeny is the integrase gene. And the integrase gene is going to allow now the chromosome of the phage to integrate into the host. And therefore, 
once you have a circularized molecule after injection, remember this is now being generated, and over here in that area you have somewhere that regulation with the battle of Cro versus C1 is happening, depending on concentration, by having that AT site integrate, that is a viral encoded gene that only gets expressed during lysogeny, is able now to cut the DNA and cut the chromosomal DNA in staggering site. In the case of lambda, that is happening between the biotin and the galactose operons, and in that place, insert the chromosome of the virus. That now becomes the lambda prophage, and that cell is able to divide and live until the conditions get better. Now, this kind of lysogenic conversion is extremely useful for bacteria. We're going to be looking that as a way, for example, many phages contain genes that, in the same way as plasmids, they are not necessary, but they're beneficial for the bacteria. So that incorporation in, of the chromosome of the phage into the chromosome of the host is going to be called lysogenic conversion. And the phenotype of the genes in that phage can change the phenotype of the host. So for example, Salmonella can be infected by the epsilon phage. And the epsilon phage has genes that are going to change LPS synthesis, basically changing and varying the lipopolysaccharide on the surface of Salmonella, which are going to change antigenic mediation and therefore allow the bacteria to survive the immune system. Also, if you have a cell infected with the epsilon virus, other viruses cannot infect it. So Corinobacterium diphtheriae and the beta phage, the beta phage is the one that encodes the toxin. So the diphtheria toxin that is the cause of the disease is not in the genome of the host, it's in the genome of the phage. So that changes. So only diphtheria, only Corinobacterium diphtheria that have phage infection have the toxin and therefore are virulent. Any questions so far? All right. Last but not least, let me show you another kind of replication. So we look at a replication based on a DNA double-stranded genome that has multiple promoters and operator regions that are going to be playing around with each other and establishing a concentration battle between, the con between two regulators, C1 versus CRO. And depending on the conditions, Whoever has the higher concentration wins the battle of lysogeny versus the battle of the lytic cycle. But here I'm going to introduce again to MS2. I already mentioned to you MS2 as a virus that uses the pillars of fertile male bacteria to infect. So here you have a male bacteria that is conjugating with a female bacteria. That is the pillars. Traditionally, we cannot see the pillars, but this pillars has been covered with virus. Here you have the virus attaching to the pillows and all of them integrating their little uh, genome inside. The genome then moves through the pillows until it gets to the cytoplasm. The capsid is always left outside. Now, this is a single-stranded positive RNA. And it has four proteins encoded in it. The maturation protein, shown here in green. The replicase protein in yellow. In tan, you have the coat protein, but notice that over the coat protein, you have a lysis protein being made. What we have in this here is that this genome is very interesting because, you know, what is one of the things that we know about RNA that makes it unique as opposed to DNA? Is that loud? Well, yeah, single-stranded, but... It makes a lot of copies, but what thing about DNA that is different from RNA? Excuse me, what thing about RNA that is very different from DNA? Huh? Yes, uracil. Think about structure, guys. Can DNA make structure molecules? RNA can be, RNA can make structures. RNA can make secondary structures, exactly. And this is what this is going to take advantage. So before I show you this, let's take a look at this. So MS2, it's an acosahedral virus here. It's the little virion capsule looking all cute. It has these four proteins. It was the first RNA virus to be isolated. And it has a single-stranded RNA molecule that the moment that that molecule gets inside, it gets translated immediately. 
Now, let's take a quick look at the cycle over here. So, as the single-stranded RNA gets injected into the cell, ribosomes are going to bind to it and make proteins. But you know what? The first protein that is being made, it's the replicase gene that is going to be used because it's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make, um, from this arrow, you follow the single-stranded RNA, is going to make a single-stranded negative copy. And now that replicase is going to use that single-stranded negative RNA to make more positive RNA. That RNA, again, can be translated immediately. So the replicase is important. You also have other proteins shown over here. So let's just look at how this is going to happen. So first, as I mentioned, replicase gets made, and the replicase is going to be used now to make a negative copy of the positive RNA. Later, you're going to have the expression of more proteins that are going to be assembled and lysed. So how is this regulated? The interest regulation happens here about this issue of the secondary structures made out of RNA. Remember, bacterial RNAs are polycystronic, meaning that you have multiple proteins encoding into it. And the virion and the bacterial uh, RNA rarely makes one protein that gets, gets chopped. What it usually has are what is called, in one RNA molecule, it has multiple ribosome binding sites. This is no different. So here, what you have is that the RNA of the virus is going to make a loop around the maturation protein gene. Here you have the ribosome binding site that eventually is going to help translate that maturation gene. So once it's in the loop, the ribosome cannot translate it. Here only in the relatively quote-unquote flat region of the genome is the code protein and the replicase gene. The lysis gene is also found in another loop and it has its own ribosome binding site. So as the RNA is injected in the cytoplasm of the bacteria, the first gene that is going to be made is going to be replicase. Now, you're going to make your negative strand. And from that negative strand, you're going to make another positive strand. So what do you think happens when this fibrin starts to come out from the replicase, as it is using the negative template to make more positive RNA, and now you have that RBS available out? What will happen at that point? it can be translated before it becomes a secondary structure. And that is the point in which the maturation protein can be made from the newly transcribed RNA. This is how the temporal function of the transcription happens. And that only happens in the bacteria because transcription and translation happen simultaneously. Think about attenuation, kind of the same mechanism. Because transcription is happening at the same time, now these two can happen. So originally you can make some code protein and originally you can make some replicase protein. So you're going to have initially, from the very beginning, a higher amount of code protein and replicase. You're not going to make sufficient protein to lyse the cell and you're not going to make sufficient protein to mature the viral particle. You're only making protein that are going to make more genome and make more code. So that is because of the AUG codon, part of the ribosome binding site. Those two proteins are the ones which are mostly accessible when that initial RNA molecule gets made. Once the molecule is made, the loops get formed, and you again make more code and more replicates. So you, in, you increase and selectively allow for the replication and translation of code and replicates. Eventually, as more comes around, you're going to have the fact that code protein is able to inhibit replicase translation. So as the higher amount of code protein gets made, eventually it can inhibit replication, translation of the replicase gene. So you stop making replicase. 
And as the leftover replicates that is already making genomes begins to make more positive RNA from the negative template, you begin to have more maturation and more lysis protein. And that point, sufficient lysis protein is made to allow mat and sufficient maturation protein is made so you can now make the phages, assemble them, and kill the cell. All right? So here, um, I show you two different examples of how, number one, you have transcription factors which are going to help decipher the fate of a phage that is infecting, either by going to the lysogenic versus the lytic pathway, or another example in which how the control of transcription and translation from an RNA molecule helps decide the natural course of action of an infection with MS2. All right? So take a look at these two mechanisms. I'm going to give you guys a little bit more update on the reading part. There is an entire section on the chapter 9 that talks about uh, life, um, the lambda phage and its lysogenic decision, as well as the MS2. I'll put that on the, um, on the reading list for you to look at it. I don't want you to read the entire chapter 9, just those parts. And... I will finish over there with this picture. This picture is the rolling cycle replication of phage thi x174, which is different from lambda. And I want you to keep this here, and I want you to tell me why it is different from lambda later in discussion. So take a look at this picture and evaluate that. And with that, I'll stop. OK? Thank you very much. And see you on Thursday. Have a happy holiday on Wednesday, guys. <laughs>